In this video, we're going to explore one of the most important concepts in the entire course. It's going to rely on knowledge of lines and planes, the notion of the span of a set of vectors, linear systems, and elementary row operations and reduced row echelon form. So if you're not really clear on any of those topics, you may want to go back to the textbook or the lecture videos and make sure you refresh your memory on those topics. So the first time we encountered the word dependent in a math class was probably in an elementary algebra class when you were learning about linear systems. And if you had a system of equations and two variables, so x and y, and the graphs of those equations overlapped, so in other words, one equation was really just the same equation as the first one uh, written in another form. We called that a dependent system, and there were infinitely many solutions. And if you think about it, the second equation doesn't really add any new solutions or, or specify any new information or any independent information. And so that's why we refer to the system as dependent. So let's see if we can extend that idea to two vectors in Rn. So an important idea is that these two lines overlap and for vectors, that we would say that they are parallel to each other. And when two vectors, and mind you, this concept or this idea of having vectors which are parallel to each other really only applies to uh, a set of two vectors. But if two vectors are parallel to each other, we call them linearly dependent. So this notion, which we have not formally defined, but we're just trying to get a handle on the concept, the notion of linear dependent is closely tied to the direction of the vectors in the set. In other words, if you have two vectors and one of the vectors uh, does not provide any new or independent direction information, then that would be a linearly dependent set. So what about three vectors? Well, suppose that we are in R3, and we have two vectors, u and v. They're not parallel to each other. If they're not parallel to each other, then certainly we can say they're not linearly dependent. And the phrase that we use for two vectors which are not parallel to each other is linearly independent. And again, I want to be cautioned here, or caution you here, that this idea of equating linearly dependence and parallel only works for two vectors, a set of two vectors. But if you have two non-parallel vectors, they can determine a plane passing through the origin. And if you have another vector, w, which lies in that same plane, then we know that we can generate w using a linear combination of u and v. So we just take a multiple of u plus a multiple of v, and that will give us w. Now, since we can generate w from u and v, we don't get any new direction information aside from the directions which are generated by u and v. So here we're not just looking at the direction of u and the direction of v, we're looking at all of the directions that could be generated by taking a linear combination of u and v. And so in that sense, the vector w does not provide any new or independent direction information. But if I have another vector a, which is not entirely in the plane, it sticks out of the plane even just a tiny bit, uh, 
uh, then it is going to provide a new direction which is independent of the directions which can be generated by u and v. So still talking about the connection between linear dependence and directions, again we said that you know, the idea is that if we have a uh, linearly dependent set, then one of the vectors in that set is not contributing any direction or new direction information. So what if I just had a set with a single vector in it? Again, a set of two parallel vectors is linearly dependent because one of the vectors does not provide any new direction information. So could we have a single vector which doesn't provide any direction information at all? So think about that. And the answer is yes. And it's our friend, the zero vector. Always that special case, the zero vector. It has zero length and its direction is indeterminate. So we don't, we can't really assign it any direction. And so if you have a set of a single vector which consists of just the zero vector, that set would be considered linearly dependent. And in fact, any set which contains the zero vector would have to be linearly dependent because that zero vector is not contributing any new independent direction information. So let's see if we can get to a formal definition of linear dependence. So we have this notion that uh, a set where you have a vector which does not contribute any new direction information would be linearly dependent. So let's see if we can connect that idea to the notion of span. So a span of a single vector, if it's an R2 or R3, is just the line through the origin. It's the set of all multiples of that vector. So if I have any vector u, which is parallel to v, it belongs to the span of v, because it's a multiple of v. And so I could write the, an equation between u and v as u equals kv. And then I'm always going to set one side equal to zero. So I could rewrite that as u minus kv equals the zero vector. So now in a plane, if we have two non-parallel vectors, their span represents a plane through the origin. So if I have a third vector which is in the plane, it can be written as a linear combination. So if it's in the plane, then it's in the span of u and v. And so it can be written as a linear combination of u and v. And again, I can set that equation equal to the zero vector. So w minus r times u minus t times v will give me the zero vector. And so if we have more than three vectors, if we have n vectors, if one of the vectors belongs to the span of the remaining vectors, it provides no new direction information. Remember, if it belongs to the span, it can be written as a linear combination of those vectors. So if Vn belongs to the span of V1 through V sub n minus 1, that means we can find coefficients C1 through Cn minus 1, such that Vn is generated by the linear combination C1 V1 plus C2 V2 all the way up to plus Cn minus 1 Vn minus 1. And again, I can set that equal to 0. So the idea is that in every one of our cases here, we could say that if you have a linearly dependent set, then you can have a vector equation or a linear combination of the vectors in the set which equal the zero vector. And that leads us 
to our formal definition of linear dependence. We're going to say that a set of n vectors is going to be linearly dependent provided that our vector equation c1 v1 plus c2 v2 all the way up to c n v n equaling the zero vector has a non-trivial solution. And in fact this equation is going to be called our dependence equation. So if your dependence equation has a non-trivial solution, really what that means is that one of the vectors can be written as a linear combination of the others. One of the vectors belongs to the span of the remaining vectors, which means that one of the vectors does not contribute any new direction information uh, in addition to the remaining vectors. Or the, the directions that can be generated by the remaining vectors. And so that's why we need to have a non-trivial solution. So a solution where at least one of the coefficients is not zero. So any set which is not linearly dependent was going to be linearly independent. So we could rewrite this definition for linearly independent sets. So if I have a set of n vectors, I would say that it's linearly independent if our dependence equation only has the trivial solution. That is, the only way that you can get a linear combination of the vectors in the set to equal the zero vector is if all of the coefficients are zero. And a direct consequence means that none of these vectors can be written as a linear combination of the remaining vectors. Each vector contributes some new independent direction information. So working with vector equations as they are written is quite challenging. However, we can always take a vector equation and turn it into a linear system. And we can always write a linear system as a matrix equation. So saying that you have a linear combination of v1, v2, up to vn equaling the zero vector, well, multiplying a matrix A times a vector x means take a linear combination of the columns of A. And so this matrix equation is equivalent to our dependence equation. And so we'll say the set S is linearly dependent, um, really if and only if this homogeneous matrix equation has a non-trivial solution. And again, non-trivial means that this vector x has at least one component which is not equal to zero, or x is not the zero vector. The solution vector is not the zero vector. And then we could restate that for linearly independent sets as well. If I take the same matrix, which has as its columns the vectors in the set, and I solve the corresponding homogeneous system if the only solution that you get it has exactly one solution, and that solution is the, that x equals the zero vector, meaning all of the components of x, x1 up through xm, are all equal to zero, then we would say the set is linearly independent. So if we think about this, um, a set S can only be linearly independent when the number of vectors in it is less than or equal to the number of components in each vector. And if you think about that, right, if in, in R3, 
The maximum number of independent directions you can have in R3 would be three. So if you have four vectors in R3, then uh, you can't have four independent directions. So your set would have to be linearly dependent. Let's state that same idea in a couple of different ways, right? If the set S has more than M vectors, in other words, if it has more vectors than components in each vector, right? And so, uh, again, in R3, you can only have three independent directions. So if you have four or five or more, any number more than three vectors, then there's no way that all of those vectors are providing new or independent direction information. So in that case, the set S would have to be linearly dependent. Now, we can restate that in terms of linear systems. If the matrix A has more columns than row, then that homogeneous system must have a non-trivial solution. So let's think about that, right? We're going to talk about this in more detail. But if we have, suppose A is, is going to have three rows and five columns. What does that tell us? Well, uh, we know that in any case you can have at most one leading one in each row. And that means uh, so we're going to have at most three leading variables. And we're talking about the homogeneous system. And that means we're going to have we're going to have at least two free variables. And so that means that we can set our free variables to be uh, non-zero numbers. And that will give us a non-trivial solution. Let's look at an example which illustrates this. So we have three vectors in R3. And we'd like to know if the set of those three vectors is linearly independent. Well, our test is going to rely on solving the homogeneous equation. So we're going to go ahead and create a matrix by putting the vectors. We're going to write the vectors as column vectors. And those column vectors are going to form the columns of our matrix. Now normally, when we're solving a system of equations, we would form the augmented matrix. Uh, but we don't really need to write the 0. And why is that? Because if we apply elementary row operations to a column of zeros, it's always just going to give us a new column of zeros. So we always know that this lost column corresponding to the right-hand side would just have all zeros in it. So when we're solving a homogeneous system, or a, we just don't even work with the, the right-hand side. We just It's understood that the right-hand side is all zeros. So I went ahead and 
put the columns in there. Let me make sure for some reason I've got a negative one here. That is a mistake. This should have been 2, 1, 1. Uh, 1, negative 1, 5. 3, negative 3, 5. So let's just go ahead and put a plus sign there. So it agrees. This is the uh, correct reduced row echelon form. We are going to see that in a minute. Uh, what does this tell me? It tells me that uh, x3, so my leading ones are in the first column and the second column. So my column 1 and column 2 are leading columns. And that tells me that x3 is free. So we'll use the parameter t. And then from this second e row, I would get that x2 plus 3x3 3 equals 0. So let me just write that down. x2 plus 3x3 3 3 equals 0. But that means that x2 is negative 3 times x3. And we're using the parameter t to represent x3. So x2 equals negative 3t. And then the first row does tell us that x1 equals 0. So again, remember, we have a column of zeros, which, we, which is understood. We do not write it out explicitly. So then x1 would be 0. x2 is negative 3 t and x3 equals t. And I can break that up into two vectors, our constant vector. Uh, and that makes sense. The span uh, should pass through the origin. And then we have a parameter times this vector right here. And so the uh, solution set um, has this form. And as I said, if we choose t to be any uh, non-zero value, so t equals 1, then this vector 0, negative 3, 1, so should be a non-trivial solution. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, verify that. Let me go ahead and 0, negative 3, 1. So let me go ahead and add that to a new page. All right. And we are going to go ahead and take that and perform the multiplication. What did we have? We had 0, uh, negative 3, 1. So I perform this uh, matrix vector multiplication. Uh, let's go ahead and do it kind of old school. 2 times 0 is 0. 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. 3 times 1 is 3. So negative 3 plus 3 is 0. Uh, so again, I'll have a 0. 3 and negative 3, that adds up to 0. And here I'll have 0, negative 15, and 15. Uh, and that's going to be 0. And again, I apologize. That this should have been plus 1 all along. And so just to be careful here, that should be a plus 1. All right. So sure enough, that is a non-trivial solution. And the conclusion is then that because we have a non-trivial solution to our homogeneous system of equations, what does that say? Uh, well, it, it really uh, is pretty clear that v2 and v3, if we look at them carefully, we could have seen that v2 and v3 are actually parallel to each other. And so that would have told us that, oh yeah, uh, this must be a linearly dependent set. But it was good to go through the uh, operations and reducing it to um, 
of transforming it to reduced row echelon form. And because that's really a, the way that we want to go about it in general. It's not always true that you're going to have two parallel vectors in a linearly dependent set. So in our example, we had a free variable in our reduced row echelon form. And uh, the set of column vectors then were a linearly dependent set. And that's really our test for linearly linear dependence. If you have a set and you, a set of vectors, you put the vectors as the columns of the matrix A, and then you go ahead and transform A to reduced row echelon form. If you have any free variables, if you have at least one free variable, then you know the set S is linearly dependent. So you can stop at that point when you get to reduced row echelon form. You don't necessarily have to find the uh, non-trivial solution or a non-trivial solution. Uh, you, you can just say, oh, because we have a free variable, then this set is going to be linearly dependent. And if we look at the columns of A, which correspond to the leading columns, so the columns that have leading ones in the reduced row echelon form, we're going to go ahead and put those columns in a new set S prime. And what can we say about this new set of vectors? Well, it is linearly independent. So if you were to form another matrix B, from those columns and uh, find its reduced row echelon form, there will be no free variables. So we know that, that the columns, the column vectors corresponding to the leading ones form a linearly independent set. And moreover, and this is just comes from solving the homogeneous system, that you can uh, write every uh, free variable as a linear combination of the vectors in S prime. In other words, a linear combination of the vectors which are columns of A corresponding to the leading ones in the reduced row echelon form. And again, if we go back to our example, how would we do that? Well, we found that we could write, uh, for example, uh, the third column, our free column, uh, could be written as a multiple of the second column. In fact, you could just take 0, right, times the first column, and then uh, add 3 times the uh, second column and that will give you the third column. So by just setting one of the parameters equal to one, the remaining parameters equal to zero, the column corresponding to that parameter, in this case the third column then, you would get an equation where you could write uh, that column as a linear combination of the leading columns. Um, if it's not clear, let's just emphasize that, that the standard basis vectors form a linearly independent set. Um, certainly if you think about it in R2 and R3, they point in the uh, positive axis direction, so they are certainly uh, completely different directions independent of each other. And let's just review some of the things that we've talked about. If you have any set containing the zero vector, it should be linearly dependent. Uh, we said that uh, because we know that the zero vector has no determinant or no determined direction, so having the zero vector in there is not going to add any new information or new direction information. And from our formal definition, 
we can always find a non-trivial solution to the dependence equation by just saying, oh, well, we're going to make every coefficient on the non-zero vectors zero, and then the coefficient on the zero vector will be one. So at least one of the coefficients is not zero, so that would be a non-trivial solution to our dependence equation. Um, if you have a single vector, then uh, the uh, set containing that single vector is linearly independent only if it's a non-zero vector, because otherwise, going back to our definition, I could just take, obviously, 1 times 0 would give me the 0 vector. So I have a, it's kind of a uh, trivial uh, dependence equation, but uh, the only way that I can have a non-trivial solution is if that vector that I started with is the 0 vector itself. And uh, again, if you only have two vectors, again, it's important that we're only looking at a set of two vectors, it's linearly dependent if and only if u and v are parallel to each other. But going only one direction, right? So in other words, you can have a set which is linearly dependent and none of the vectors are parallel to each other. However, if you have a set and you can see, like we saw in our example, that two of the vectors are parallel to each other, then it's going to be linearly dependent. So be careful here what the, what the given is and what the conclusion. Here the given is that you have two parallel vectors in your set. The conclusion is that they are linearly dependent. However, going the other direction, if you say you have a set of linearly dependent vectors, then you don't have to have any of the vectors there parallel to each other. All right, and then if you have three vectors in R3, uh, they're uh, going to be linearly dependent if they're all on the same plane. So they are coplanar. And what else did we say? We said that uh, if you have a set of vectors, it'll be linearly dependent if and only if at least one of the vectors, and it may only be one of them, one of the vectors can be expressed as a linear combination of the other vectors in S. And that's just restating what we looked at at the beginning, that if you have a set of vectors, say three vectors in R3, they all lay on the same plane, then that vector W can be written as a linear combination of U and V, so it's not providing any new direction information. But on the other hand, we have a named theorem, the extension theorem. It says that if you're given a linearly independent set, and you're given a new vector, which is not in the span of S, so you cannot be generated from any linear combination of the vectors in S, then we can create an extended set. So we add the vector U to our given set, we get a new set, S prime. That extended set is also going to be linearly independent. And we saw that in the example at the beginning where we had two vectors, they're linearly independent because their u and v are not parallel to each other. They generate this plane. And then we had a third vector, a, which is not in the plane, sticks out of the plane a little bit. So now the set of a, u, and v would be linearly independent. So I hope this video was uh, useful. And if we need to, we can review this material in our uh, Zoom sessions or classroom sessions.